Our guest today is Admiral James Stavridis. He was the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, and then he served as the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. I'm going to ask him what he thinks the future of the military might look like in a post-COVID world. Actually, the question might be the future of the military with COVID. I think we'll end up living with this uh, perhaps more than we think. Uh, first of all, I think it's clear there's going to be downward pressure on defense budgets. Um, this is going to be natural. I think it's going to be appropriate. Um, it will be both because we will want to be better prepared for another pandemic, which I think is a likelihood that will create downward pressure. I think particularly on military budgets because there'll be a psychological similarity between the idea of defending the nation against physical threats and defending the nation against biological threats. Secondly, downward pressure because of the economic damage that is going to be done as a result of COVID, the massive deficits. Um, I think in practical terms, it means uh, first and foremost, we will reduce the number of people in the military because people are the most expensive attribute. So that means three key things. One is an emphasis on unmanned platforms, remotely piloted vehicles in the air, sometimes called drones, but also on the surface of the ground, the surface of the sea, and even under sea, unmanned vehicles uh, will get more and more attention and play. Secondly, cyber and cyber security. We will use cyber not only to defend ourselves, but I think also a deal to prepare for offensive cyber operations in order to create deterrence in a world where we don't have as large a physical military at our disposal. And third and finally, I think all of this will create an upsurge in special forces, small elite teams, as opposed to massive ground formations, more Navy SEALs, more Green Berets, more special cyber warfare experts, uh, more experts in operating these unmanned vehicles, smaller, more elite. Ultimately though, all of those things will help us control costs in a military that is going to have to be somewhat less engaged globally than it is today. And all of this will happen in a global context where the world seems to be coming to a boil, uh, whether it is in China, whether it is in Europe. Uh, how do you think that will play out? Let's begin with our own nation, the United States. I think here you're going to see less appetite for global engagement. You're going to see uh, less desire to fund large military establishments in Europe, where we still have 65,000 troops in South Korea, where we have 35,000 troops, in Japan, where we have tens of thousands of troops. On the other hand, China will come out of this more globally engaged. We've already seen that, particularly as they move to consolidate what's sometimes called one belt, one road. They will come out of this with a more forward-leaning posture globally. So as a result of that, I think for the United States, alliances become more important. NATO becomes more important. If we're not going to have a strong forward troop presence in Europe, our NATO allies, who are of course our European allies, will have to step up in order to create deterrence, for example, against Russia, to police that southern border of NATO, uh, both the Mediterranean and the turbulent Middle East. In Asia, you'll see a growing alignment between the United States, Japan, who is a very strong treaty ally, and India. I think increasingly India will want to counterbalance a rising China. We're not going to have the equivalent of NATO in the Pacific, but I think look for less U.S. forward troop presence but more reliance on allies going forward. NATO, of course, will see the same type of downward pressures that you are talking about, as will others. You're correct, Adil. There will be downward pressure on European defense budgets and downward pressure on U.S. defense budgets. But I think the impact of that will be both sides wanting to work together to have collective security. Bottom line, I think that while European defense spending will go down somewhat, 
in U.S. defense spending will go down somewhat. When we think of it collectively, it's still an enormous pool of resources as follows. Let's do the numbers for a moment. The United States spends <clears throat> $600 billion a year in defense. The Europeans spend $300 billion a year in defense. China, China only spends about 200 to 250 billion dollars on defense. So even if China's budget goes up, very questionable, China will face economic challenges as the world economy slows. The US and Europeans can still take a dividend away from their almost $1 trillion in defense spending, but collectively, it will be far, far stronger than China or Russia or China and Russia combined, frankly.